Good morning. So good to see you guys. So good to be here. It's a good day to be together. I want to tell you about some things that are coming up. First of all, um, Icon, boy, last Sunday, from what I heard and the pictures that I saw, you guys had a bang up good time jumping and dodging balls and eating chicken and all that stuff. So uh, Icon meets again today. Immediately following the service, if you're a high school student, if you're a middle school student, or if you know someone who falls into that category, get them here, call them, invite them, tell them to get here by 12.30. Uh, so Icon's meeting today, immediately following the service. So stick around, and if you got a friend you can invite, call them and, and get them here. Next thing, we've got our prayer gathering coming up on Tuesday. It's been a meaningful time for me. Um, it's been a meaningful time for uh, many of you who have been here. You've, you've told me that. I've had the opportunity to pray for some of you. Lydia and I have had the opportunity to pray for some of you. Pastor Billy and I have had the opportunity to pray for some of you. Uh, I just, the rest of you, you're missing out. So I hope you'll be here Tuesday night. It, it comes and goes really quickly, that hour. And you can come at 7.15 and stick around for 30 minutes. Just come and stay as long as you want. Uh, but that is a good time. And I do believe um, this is understated today. Uh, because I just don't have time to spend on it. But I really do believe that who we, are, who, we are, who we are becoming as a church and what God is going to do in our church over the next 12 months really revolves around our corporate, collective, and individual prayers. Uh, and so to that end, we gather on Tuesday nights and pray. Next thing, if you are not connected, and many of you are but if you're not in a gospel community, uh, if you're not, which is what we call small groups or prayer, prayer groups or Bible studies, if, that's not, if, if you're not in one of those, then you uh, hit us up. Send us an email. Uh, go there, and it's real simple. Uh, your name will come to me or Pastor Billy, and we will get you into a gospel community. We've got several that meet uh, throughout the week. We've got a men's group that meets here on um, Wednesday mornings. We've got a ladies group that meets here um, on Thursday evenings. And then there are other groups that are mixed and co-ed and different ages and whatnot, including ICON. ICON really is a gospel community in and of itself. So get connected. That is my point. If you can pray, if, if, if you'll spend time praying regularly, which means turning off the noise. And I mean for a while. It can't be like 10 seconds of let's see if we hear from God. Guess not. You want to go to Starbucks? No, if you'll just turn off the noise and stop and rest in the Lord's presence for a time, if you'll do that in your life, and then if you'll live meaningfully in a connected way in community with other believers, I promise you life will go well for you. I, I, I promise. It's not me that promises that. It's really the teachings of Jesus. So, pray and get connected. I think that's it, right? Do we have anything else going on that I need to talk about? That's it. Would you join me and let us pray right now? God, we come before you or under you today, under your teaching, under your lordship, Jesus Christ, under your leading. We come under that today as we, as we come to worship together. Uh, we want to, be, uh, to, to hear from you, we want to uh, be uh, molded and shaped by you. Um, we we want to know, you know, in this next hour, if, if like our lives are going in a direction, you want us to go a different, different direction. We want to know that. We just, we've, uh, most of us, we've come with a real sense of, of, um, of submission, submission to you. So if you would speak to us, uh, if, first, if you would just turn off the noise of the world and, 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 and all of the stuff going on, important stuff, but if you would just, God, if you would just turn off the noise in our ears so that we might hear from you, and, and, and then if you would just give us hearts that are receptive, even that is dependent on your working in us. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. We want to hear from you. Of course, you're welcome. You go wherever you want, but you're welcome in the sense that we don't want to miss you. We don't want to we don't want to come and then go and then say, we didn't even hear from the Lord. We, you're, you're welcome here, Holy Spirit. If you would speak in us, through us, speak in and through me as I, as I preach your words. May what I say 
uh, that, that is from you, may it have a sticking or a staying power. And may what I say that's just of me, may it, may it fall away quickly. And we pray this in, in the strong and mighty and able, capable name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, this is the, uh, it's the summer of love. I was at a family party last night, and, and it, I was tickled when someone asked about the, uh, the sermon series, and then another family member said, yeah, it's, it's the summer of love. I, I like that. I don't, know, I don't know why, but if you, maybe if you tell your friends that, that we're, we're, uh, we're, we're wrapping up the summer of love at River Church, maybe they, they want to come for the last few weeks of this experience. We've been studying the, 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 not the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, a letter way in the back at the end of the, of, of the New Testament, at the end of the Bible, written by the same guy, John the Apostle. And if we can just review for just a minute, we're not going to project this, uh, but if we can just review from something I preached two weeks ago, the main point, the whole point of the book, do you remember, don't, don't say it out loud, but just in your own in your own mind, see if you can remember. The whole point of the book, the point of the whole book, we find it in chapter 5, I preached on it two weeks ago, this is the whole point, that we may find God confidence in our eternal life, and that we may find God confidence in his willingness to answer us when we pray. The whole point of, 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 the, of, the, of 1 John the first epistle of John, is that we would have this confidence that I, I, am, I, have, I have an eternal home with Jesus. I am an eternal being. I am a recipient by God's grace of eternal life. And then, and then also I am, I am confident. And man, some of, us, some of us in this room are going through some tough stuff. And what we say is like, I'm confident that the Lord hears me. When I pray, my, my prayers don't fall on deaf ears. My, 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 my Lord, he is, he is imminent, which means he leans into us. He's also transcendent, which means he can't be contained by time and space, but he's imminent. He leans in and he, he wants, he invites us to pray, and he hears us and he responds. He works on our behalf. And so that's the point of, of, of 1 John, really. And he was, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, humanize this book or kind of read into it just for a moment. Like, because I'm a pastor. He was a pastor. I know some people had left his church. And he was angry about that, I think, because that's, you know, he's human. But he was also, what he was upset about was that they were leaving because they didn't understand the truth and beauty of who Jesus really is. And so he, he wants to, like, drill down deeper. I want you to know. I want you to understand who this is, this Jesus. So before we continue on week seven, jump into a new reading, I want to I introduce to you uh, three words. I want to give you some definitions. You can take a picture with your camera if you want or write it down, whatever. Uh, now, some of you, are, you you've, heard the, you've heard all three of these words, but I want to introduce or at least shore up your understanding, your definition of these three words because it's really of vital importance as a person of faith, that you understand these three words. Three big, three big words. The first one is redemption. Another word for that, they're almost synonymous. They're close to being synonymous. And, and that is, um, you've got that, right? No, let me just go to that next uh, word. The first word is redemption. And uh, the, the almost synonymous word would be salvation. And... Um, so there's a, there's a typo here, but let's just read this. It's Christ's saving, it should be work. There's a missing word there. Christ's saving work on the cross that satisfied God's wrath toward our sin. As a result of God's, uh, as a result, God's wrath toward us has been replaced with his favor. That's redemption. That's salvation. And some of you are like, oh, I know that, Randy. I know, but yeah, but, but lean in a little deeper. Like, look a little closer. Contemplate, because you may have engineered, structured your life. We all do this. You may have structured your life in a self-righteous way, where you feel like, like your righteousness is based on your uh, ability to, to achieve, perform, do good works, um, follow the rules. 
And what happens is it messes with your emotions. It messes with your psyche because deep down you're like, man, I really, I'm not that good. Like, like, so, so maybe I'm not saved because I, I'm not a very good rule keeper or I'm keeping the rules, you know, like the little kid who said, you know, he's, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sitting down on the, on, the, on the outside, but I'm really standing up. I'm rebellious on the inside, you know. I'm obeying the rules. And when we, when we become self-righteous, then it just tears us up inside because we think, like, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I haven't been redeemed, but, but the, actual, the actual definition of, re- of redemption is Christ's saving work on the cross. He didn't know what you did, what he, what he did, uh, that, that satisfied God's wrath. God was, 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 he hates sin because he's righteous. His, his wrath is rightly pointed, aimed straight at sin and sinners because he's righteous, he's holy, he's just. But he made a way in sending his son on the cross to absorb all that, and so as a result, what used to be uh, this position of, 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 of being in the hot seat, that God's wrath is toward us, now that's been replaced not with neutrality, but rather favor. And some of you need to understand that. Like, what was replaced, what, what used to be uh, pointed at you, this, this white, hot, angry, wrath regarding sin, as Christ absorbed all that, the propitiation of your sins, he said it's finished, it's done. What, what was then replaced, or, or what replaced that, wasn't just neutrality, not like that God, the God just, he tolerates you, but rather from the whole of Scripture, what we find out is he actually favors you. Redemption, the second word, the second word is, is born out of this question. If Christ does the work, if Christ does the work, then where does obedience in the life of a Christian have come? Like, what, what, where does it come into the picture? By the way, I skipped a couple of things. Go back a couple of verses. I want to show you a couple of things. Uh, or actually, go forward to the next one. There you go. Okay. Before we get to, uh, before we get to the next word, this is what, uh, what, what, what 2 Corinthians says. The question means, if, if you're saved, if you're saved, it's not a good question, but a statement. if you're saved, it's not because of your good deeds, right? That's self-righteous, but, but because of Christ's work on the cross. And, and Paul reminded us that in this passage when he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's not what you've done. It's what Christ has done for you. So R.C. Sproul, who, who passed away a few years ago, he used to say this. He used to say, if I am in Christ, I'm a new creation, if I'm in Christ, it's because God took me out of the world and gave me to Christ. The point is, it's not anything that you've done. It's not on your own merit. It's not on your own work. It's not because you're a good rule keeper or because you're, you know, you're better at it than me or you're all that. It's because of what God has done in us through Christ. So now here's the question that I said earlier. Now, I'm, now, now I've arrived uh, at this question. So if Christ does the work, he's the one that saved you. He's the one that 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 replaced this wrath with God's favor. If Christ did the work, then why do we even need to obey? Why do we even need to follow rules at all? I mean, that's an ancient, age-old question. Back in Paul's day, people would that ask that same question. Why do we even need to attempt to be like Jesus or to follow any kind of rules? Because it's all Jesus, it's not me. That's sort of a logical question, except it's flawed in nature. I'm going to give you the second word, and I'll expl- explain to you why it's flawed in nature. The next word is sanctification, a big word, sanctification. And uh, these, these definitions get longer and longer. The first one I wrote, the second one, this one is written by Wayne, Dr. Wayne Grudem, um, not the coach, the professor. Uh, never mind. Um, the, profess- the, the, the progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and more and more like Christ 
in our actual lives. So that's probably, that's probably somewhat familiar to you. You probably have an understanding, if you've been a Christian for a while, you probably have an understanding that, that, the, that the Christian life is supposed to entail you sinning less and becoming more like Christ. Now, if you would say that you have some understanding of that as being the, 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 the life that the Christian is to lead, then, and this is the right answer. I'm not tricking you. If you would say, yeah, I have, I have an understanding uh, regarding that, sanctification, I've heard that, I understand that is, that's what's supposed to be happening in my life. Would you raise your hand if you have some, and it's the right answer, don't, don't feel like I'm tricking you. If you would say, I can't see you because the light's really bright, but if you would say, yeah, that, I understand that, And progressive, the word progressive means that it's happening gradually over time and over stages. So in other words, you know, maybe you'd be like, yesterday I hit my brother in the face five times, but today I only punched him once. Like it's progressive. Like you're sinning less and less and you're becoming more and more like Jesus. For instance, maybe you would say, yesterday or last year I was really, really stingy and tight with my money, but but, but, but uh, like a year later, like I, I know a friend of mine was down and out and really needed, and, and I felt generous toward my, my needy friend, and that's Jesus, that's not me. And so you'd say progressively, stay, over, over the course of time, in stages, God is working in your heart. The progressive work of God in man. He's working in you. He's working through you. He's freeing you from sin. He's, he's making you more and more like Christ. And, and over the course of your life, um, this is the work of God in your life, sanctifying you, making you more free from sin. In fact, if there is no sanctification, hear me now. If there is no sanctification happening in your life, there's just no no change, uh, no victory over sin, uh, no evidence that, 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 that God is making you more like Jesus, then I say this gently, but then you, according to Scripture, you're not a, you're not a Christ follower, you're not a Christian. Because sanctification is the result of Christ's work on the cross, your submission to Christ, what naturally happens is you're being sanctified. Okay, final word, final step in the Christian experience. This is a word we do not talk about enough, and that is the word glorification. Glorification is this. It's the final step in the act of redemption. If if, if redemption is like an overarching term for this whole process that I'm talking about, being saved being sanctified, if all of that is redemption, I've, I've kind of mixed words here now, but if all, of that's re- if all of that is redemption, we're saved, we're sanctified, then the final step, actually more than a step, it's the final goal in the Christian experience, it's glorification. What is that? Glorification is this, the final step in the application of redemption. It will happen when Christ returns and raises from the dead the bodies of all believers for all time who have died. You've heard about Jesus coming back, even if you're not a Christ follower. You probably, you, you know, or you've seen some, probably some jacked up movie about end times and, in, in, you know, Jesus came back, right? And so that, but that actually is in Scripture, not according to the, mo- not, not like the movies you've seen, but that is in Scripture. Jesus is coming back one day and he's going to raise all the dead bodies of all the believers for all time who've died and reunite them with their souls and he changes the bodies of all believers who remain alive thereby giving all believers at the same time perfect resurrection bodies like his Jesus, like his own. That's also by Dr. Wayne Grudem. So that is, that is glorification. That is, the, that is the final stage, the final step that, friends, I just don't believe we as a church talk about, and I mean the church broadly, we don't talk about enough. We are saved we are sanctified, and, and, and ultimately, the Christian experience, ultimately, we're glorified. 
So the question, when I was like studying this this week, the, the question that, that was really, that is really begged uh, is, okay, so I've been thinking about this a lot also with, with Marianne, my, my mother-in-law's passing in our memorial service yesterday. The, the big question is, okay, so what happens to the soul of believers who have died like up until this moment? Because Jesus hasn't come back yet, so like are they in... Uh, I'm going to use a word that I don't even like. In limbo, like what, 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 what's the state of the soul of the believer? Jesus hasn't come back yet. And, and the answer I want to get to quickly is they go immediately into the presence of Jesus. And I believe that based on several passages, including, including when Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So, so our friends that have passed away in the last few years, Marianne and Carrie, in other words, uh, others, they, they're, they're in the presence of Jesus right now. He, he welcomed them the moment that they passed away. And another verse uh, that speaks to that, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and a home with the Lord. Paul's writing that. He's saying to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. There's no limbo. There's no, not to cast any stones here, but purgatory. There's no in-between. To, be, to, to, to leave when the soul leaves the body, it goes to be with Jesus immediately. Okay, this is all preliminary. We haven't even gotten today's passage yet. Glorification. Ultimately, Ultimately, however, even though we go immediately, immediately to be with Jesus, uh, ultimately, according to Scripture, and I can't even connect all the dot, paint a, paint a colorful picture for you uh, today regarding this, because it's still a bit um, not completely um, explained in every detail in Scripture. But what we can gather from Scripture is, is that ultimately, ultimately one day we will receive a resurrection body. When Christ redeemed us, he did not just redeem our souls. You need to hear that because much sin and folly historically has, been, has played out because people only believe that God saved their soul and so they could do whatever they wanted with their bodies. And that's not true. God, God has saved every being, every aspect of who you are. When Christ redeemed us, he did not just redeem our souls. He redeemed us as whole beings. To be a human means you have a body, means that you are flesh and blood and soul and spirit and personality and emotions. And, and, and he redeemed us as whole persons, not just, not just a part of us. He redeemed us as whole persons. Includes the redemption of our bodies. And when we die, our bodies decompose, not to be too gross, but or, or cremated, right? And like, well, well, then what happens? Like, well, don't you think God could overcome that? And when our bodies break down or cremated or whatever, the, the day will come when the Lord will reanimate our bodies and we will receive new resurrection bodies, purpose built for heaven, purpose built for home, purpose built for eternity, redemption is not complete in a sense. It's not complete in a sense until our bodies are completely freed up. What do I mean by freed up? You, you feel a bit fettered, a bit tied down, a bit weighed down, a bit, a bit uh, clunky and, and, and maybe, maybe less than healthy and, and, and whatever. Redemption is not complete until our bodies are completely free from the effects of sin and from the effects of the fall. So in other words, one day for eternity, there'll be no cancer. There'll be no sin. There'll be no cheating on your spouse. There'll be no lying. There'll be no heart attacks. There'll be no diabetes. There will be no toothaches. Uh, there will be no want and, and hurt and pain, the redemption of us ultimately results in the glorification of our minds and our bodies and our spirits and our entire beings. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Behold, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, as we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on <clears throat> the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When 
The perishable puts on the imperishable. The mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And if you've ever, if you've ever sat um, next to the bedside of a, of a dying loved one, you, you know that tension. Where you, if, if, if your family member is a believer and you'd say, you know, death, I hate you, death, but ultimately, where is your sting? Because this person will live for eternity. This person and his or her broke down old body is going to be replaced with a resurrection body. Death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? You have no victory. And so for those of us who are Christ followers, for those of us who are purpose built for eternity, death ultimately is not victorious. We will overcome. And not only the body of the believer, but, but all of creation. This new heaven and new earth that come together, there's no longer a chasm between heaven and earth. No longer a chasm between us and God. Ultimately, this new heaven and this new earth, they merge, they come together, they're connected. And the point is, all of creation is renewed. Not just us, not just our bodies, but all that we know of heaven and earth. Now let me ask you, why is this so important? Why do I get excited about that. I mean, it doesn't seem like maybe you're as excited about it as I am. Why do I get excited about this? And the reason is because I think it, 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 it elevates, it elevates how we live as Christ followers right now and how we see our physical self right now. How you see your physical body is an integral part of your spiritual being. And what you do physically and how it's intrinsically wrapped up in who you are as a spiritual person. person. Redemption, sanctification. Most of you, well, no, no, let, me, let, me, let me restate that so that I don't judge you. I fear that often we, collectively, the body of Christ, we live as though sanctification is our ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is just to be more and more like Jesus and more and more like Jesus, and I'm going to fail often, but more and more like Jesus. And I would tell you, that is a beautiful process, but that is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal, goal is glorification. One day, when we slough off all of that sin, all of that sinful nature, and we are like Jesus. Okay, having said all of that, now... Let's spend a little bit of time in today's passage. And what I want you to know is, here's what we're talking about today. Sons and daughters of the living God. Go to that next slide. This is who we are. You are a son of the living God. You are a daughter of the living God. You are heirs of all that God has for you. All that he has for eternity is yours. You are heirs of that. Sons and daughters of the living God. And that's what we're looking at today. 1 John chapter 3. Long passage, but it's an important passage. Read along as I read out loud. You read along silently. It says this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That we should be called children of God. You're a son, a daughter of the living God. Let me start again. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him, Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him, purifies himself as he is pure. Now, what does that sound like to you? And I'll give you the answer. That sounds like sanctification. Being purified, everyone thus hopes in, that, that, uh, thus hopes in him, is, uh, uh, purifies himself as Jesus is pure. 
What are you supposed to be doing on this earth? What, are you, what is your role? Purifying yourself. What is God's role? Purifying you. They're really inseparable. You cannot purify yourself except that the Holy Spirit is working in and working through you and, and rooting out the sin and making you more like Jesus. And that is, again, that second stage, sanctification. To be purified. Verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Verse 5. You know that he appeared, Jesus appeared, in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. What's it saying? It's saying if, sanctify, if sanctification is not happening in your life, you're not becoming more like Jesus. You're just the same as you were, just the same broke down sinner that you were 10 years ago. Then there's no sanctification in your life. And he's saying that's not what it looks like to be a Christian. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Jesus or known Jesus. Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. And then he makes a very positive statement. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as Jesus is righteous. I'm going to go right on to verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who, the chi- who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer out loud, but because if you get it right or you get it wrong, or some of us will be embarrassed, or just, just, but just in your own heart. Is this passage, now that we've talked about redemption, salvation, sanctification, this process that we're in right now, glorification, is this passage that I just read, is it about sanctification or is it, or is it about glorification? And I think we would be quick, because we kind of live here mentally, I think we would be quick to say, oh, it's about sanctification. And I would challenge that notion. I mean, certainly, this passage is about salvation, that Jesus has effectively saved us. And it is about, it is about sanctification, certainly, because it talks about purifying yourself as Jesus is pure. But I would submit to you today that this passage is mostly and ultimately about, about glorification, it's saying because you are glorified or because you are moving in that direction, because you will one day be glorified, because you are a child of the living God, guess what? Children of the living God, they don't, they don't keep on sinning. They run from sin. Why? Because, because they, have a, they have a different name. They have, they have, a, they have, a, they have a different king. They, they, have, they have a different position. They're heirs. They're now, they're now family members Sanctification is finally a means, ultimately, to glorification. Whoever is sanctified will ultimately be glorified, will will abide forever. Now, if you stick with me here, I I know this is kind of heady, but I think it's important for us to realize that that a very myopic view, like just like thinking about yourself all the time, and I fall in this trap, I bet you do too. Thinking about myself, like it's, it's a very subjective view of Christianity. And it, it goes like this, it's like, man, I, man, I just, why can't I, why can't I escape my, this miserably sinful life that I'm living? Like, yeah, I, just, I want to do better, but I, I can't. And, you know, or, 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 or it's like this, this sinfully, dull, miserable, boring life that I lead, and I just, we, we lament our sin, and then maybe we, we, we lament the utter dullness of life, 
our existence, and I, I focus on self, and I, I focus on my, my own ability to, de- to defeat sin, but the problem is I'm, I'm often, I often fail at trying to defeat sin, and, and, I, and, I, th- and I think about how my, my, my sanctification is not going very well, I'm not becoming more like Jesus, and it's just very myopic, very subjective view of the Christian life, and it stops short of focusing on the fact that ultimately and forever we will abide with Jesus Christ. And our goal right now is just to start getting ready for that. Your ultimate goal isn't to fix yourself and to to stop doing that junk that nobody knows you do, but you want to you stop, but then you're embarrassed, and you, you keep on doing it, and you, you, you just hide it, and you feel terrible about it, and you, you think, man, I, I'm supposed to be sanctifying myself, and I'm, I'm supposed to be running from sin, but I just have no... And, and you just, it's very subjective, and it's very myopic, and it's very thinking, but, but ultimately what I think we need to embrace more and more is our identity in Christ, that, that we are purpose-built for eternity. Glorification is where we're headed. This sanctification process is merely a means to the end. First, first John chapter two verse seventeen says this. So, and this world is passing away along with its desire. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. How sad! How sad that there are people running around this earth right now thinking that like. Man, I've only got 35 more years to, to make something of myself. I, I've, only got, I've only got, I don't know why I'm looking at my watch. My watch doesn't have years. It just has the hours. But um, I, I, I don't, I've only got like, you know, 10 more years of, of, of really good living. And I haven't done what I wanted to do. I haven't made much of myself. How sad for those people. But how glad I am for those of us who are following Christ. And we say, we're, we're purpose-built for glorification. Sons and daughters of the living God. We will abide forever. If you don't reach your goals on this earth, I mean, I hope you do. But if you don't, guess what? It ain't that big of a deal. You, you, you're just traveling through. You, you weren't purpose-built for the next 70, 80, 90 years. You're purpose-built for eternity. And right now, it's just kind of like getting ready for that. You know how like, you, if you went to college or trade school or something, you thought that was real life, and then you got out and you realized, look, that was just prep. Like, that wasn't real life. In a sense, it's like that. Ultimately, and for eternity, we will be glorified. Now, let me, we're not going to project it again. Let me reread the first verse that I read to you, and it goes like this. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Let that sink in. He calls you child. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. My, my, my father passed away almost nine years ago, but in fact, he, it was nine years ago. Um, but when my father would just speak one word, he would, my, my father would capture my attention with just the one word, son, Son, this is your father. But I knew it was my father because just one word, son. And I knew, I, I knew his voice. And God calls you daughter, son. I, I can still hear, I, I remember my father waking me up at 4 a.m. with that one word, son. And it was a familiar voice. And it was, it was a tender word. And if I'm quiet, I can still hear my father, my earthly father's voice and, and those words. And, and he used to tell me, he used to tell me, 
that he was certain that I could, when I, that I could do something when I wasn't even certain myself that I could do that thing. And, and, and in a world where everything is earned, like that's the, that's the world that you live in, right? That's, that's the economy of this world. In a world where everything is earned, in my relationship with my earthly daddy, because I had a good daddy, and I realize some of you didn't or don't, but in my earthly relationship, I always felt like I had nothing to, to earn. Um, I didn't have to earn my father's love. Like, he loved me. I mean, you're living in a system. We are living in this broken system of, uh, of this, the, the, the world's economy, the world's economy where, where you earn everything. You earn praise, and you earn grades. You earn playing time out on the field. You earn attention. Uh, you earn paychecks. And we learn this before we can even speak, that we've got to do, do, do in order to get what we want. And into that, into that broken economy of the world, God speaks his own economy, his own system, in which he says, you don't have to earn it. By grace, you are now sons and daughters of the living God. By, by grace, we receive his favor. That's how God sees you. It's all like, man, I'm so focused on sanctification. I'm going I'm to quit sinning. I'm going to fix myself. And then God will. That is not the ultimate direction or point of Christian living. I, I remember when my oldest son, Truett, was born um, 26 years ago. And, um, you know, it's, it's different when your first child is born because you've, you have no con. You, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so uh, he was born, and I'd never been a dad before. And I remember, I remember calling my dad on the phone. I was in Arlington, Texas. Lydia and I were in Arlington, and my dad was living down there. Calling my, my dad when True was born. He'd only been born for like minutes, and crying on the phone, and saying, it is so weird, Dad. I'm talking to my dad. It is so weird. I love this little guy, and he hasn't even done anything yet. Like, how is that possible that I love him and he hasn't even done anything yet? And that is the love of the Father for you. He doesn't love you because you've done anything for him. He did it all for you. Receive that. Embrace that. God has chosen to send his son on the cross to redeem you. And God is currently in the business of sanctifying you. And, and, and one day, God will ultima, ultimately glorify you. And that, that friends, that is our motivation for, for, for killing sin in the mortal flesh. Because yes, Yes, the flesh does matter. You, you are physically, emotionally, spiritually a child of God. And so we, we want to act like it. We, we want to we we live like it. Three summary points, and we're done real quick. Number one, <clears throat> number one summary of all we've talked about. Number one, not all are children of God. That's, I wish I didn't have to say that, but, but that, is, that is the case. And we need, we need to be honest about this and, and, and seriously um, concerned about our friends and our neighbors who don't yet know Jesus. The, this first, verse 10, go to the next slide. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It's clear that, that John in this letter is not saying like everybody that can fog a mirror is a child of God. He's not saying that. He's saying that those who have submitted to Christ, who've come under the lordship of Christ, who have received the blessing of what he has done on the cross, 
the first summary point is not all our children have gotten. The second summary point, the second summary point is, but you are. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. Beloved, we are now children. Verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what, what we will be has not yet appeared, but what we know, uh, but we know that, that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. You are a child of God. And then the third, the third point, and more of a question that I want to answer here briefly, and that is, well, what does all that mean, Pastor Andy? Like, what does that mean? Well, it means that the Father loves you. It means that you are righteous. He sees you as righteous. He doesn't just tolerate you. He sees you through this lens, Jesus Christ, and you're righteous. And it means this. It means that you have an inheritance coming your way. See what kind of love the Father has given. That we should be called children of God, and so we are. Hear hear these words. He loves you. God loves you. The Father loves you. You say, but Pastor Randy, I don't feel very loved, or I don't feel very lovely, and I would say, of course you you don't, because remember we talked about this a few weeks ago. Your heart lies to you. Your heart lies to you all the time. It it brings up the past, and, 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 and it shames you, and it shades you, and your heart. It tells you that you're, 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 you're trash. It deceives you. But verse 7, we read it, but let's see it again. Verse 7. Go a few slides later. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. If you have a deceiving voice in your head that bringing up your past or your perceived shame or your real shame... Don't believe that voice for a minute. You're righteous. Jesus' work on the cross has made you righteous. Live like you're righteous. Embrace that. Believe that. Embrace your inheritance. Last passage we're going to read is Romans 8, and it speaks of this. Here's what it says. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're, you're stuck in fear, and living kind of like a slave to your old self. But you, you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Maybe that's you with your sin patterns. Maybe you feel like, man, I'm just enslaved to, to sin. And you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we call or we cry, rather, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. What does that mean? If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You see, the ultimate motivation in obeying Christ, the ultimate motivation in killing sin in your life, the ultimate motivation being conformed to his image, all of that, the ultimate motivation is not so that you can be good on the earth so that God will love you. Ultimately, the motivation, the goal, it's glorification. You're you're a kingdom citizen. You're a child of God. You have an inheritance coming your way. And, And children of the king, well, they live differently, don't they? They live like the king. They live to please the king. They 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 live up to the name. There's great honor, great valor. There's an inheritance coming your way. Some will tell you that your best days, they're now. Live it up. That that, that God wants for you prosperity. That that prosperity is coming to you today in in the form of wealth and and health and 
and that, that right now on this earth, in, this, in, in the world's economy, that the Lord will, he wants to bless you. The problem with that is that, that that's not what scripture says. The problem is that, look at the last, the last verse that we just read. It says that you're heirs of God, provided you suffer with him. Because this earth, this world, it's not your home. This verse smacks in the face of the thought that somehow now we're going to be rewarded. What I want you to understand, folks, is that, that the Lord is for you. The, the Lord is radically for you. He's your daddy, he's your Abba, he's your father, he's working on your behalf. He has an inheritance for you to enjoy for eternity. He is sanctifying you that he might one day glorify you. He is for you. He is not your enemy, he is your friend. I want for this song that it would, that it would, that it would wash over you and that, that you would just really feel and experience the, the pleasure, the pleasure of God over you. The, the, the Lord God, he, he did the hardest thing that could ever have been done, cleared the highest hurdle that it could ever have been cleared in, in determining that he would send his son to die on a cross for you. That is the hardest thing, the highest hurdle that has ever been cleared. Now, now rest in this truth. He who did not spare his own son Will he not also give you every good gift? The Father loves you immensely. Just enjoy this song.